Hey friends, Jeff here with a new episode of Conversations Life Science Leaders Aren't Having. Today we welcome Leslie Loveless. Leslie is the CEO at Sloan Partners. Sloan is an executive search firm specializing in delivering top diverse and visionary leadership to life science and healthcare companies. Who Leslie is to me is integrity. And not integrity in the sense of doing what she says she'll do, but integrity in how she goes about serving her clients and the candidates for the roles that she and her team are looking to fill. She is passionate about creating extraordinary experiences for all the parties involved and being a true partner. A word that I see Leslie embodying is stewardship. She has this responsibility with her and her team, and she wants to do an excellent job in serving her clients. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with Leslie Loveless. Leslie Loveless, welcome to the show. So happy to have you. Excited to dig in today and and just welcome, hearty welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here today. So I just did a brief introduction of you and who you are to me in the short time that we've gotten to know each other. Share with us what you're up to in the world. Sure. So thank you for the question. And uh, I'll start with just something personal. Spring is uh, in the air. And my favorite thing to do when spring rolls around is plant flowers. So that is a therapy for me. I love everything about it. Um, Everything from going to the different nurseries to pick out what I'm going to plant this year to digging in the dirt uh, to watching the flowers bloom all spring and summer. So that is um, very therapeutic to me and I love it. Um, aside from that, I feel like what I spend almost all of my time doing is thinking, I, I feel like I am the epitome of every funny meme that you see where, uh, there's this image that you could see inside my brain. You would see that there are 150 tabs open at any point in the day. And that is definitely me just constantly thinking about how to be more efficient, more effective to just do things better. So that's that's kind of where I am in life right now. And Sloan Partners, uh, tell us more about Sloan Partners and 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 the work that you guys do in the world. Sure. So uh, Sloan is about 24 years old, and I've been with the firm for 17 and a half years. And it's a really special place, a special company. We have a lot of longevity on our team, which... Um, adds to the the wonderful feeling of being part of this company. Uh, Our focus is in uh, completing executive and leadership searches for companies in life sciences and healthcare. Uh, We gravitate toward companies that are early stage and growth stage. So we get to um, really be part of building companies, which is an amazing feeling. It's it's so much more rewarding than uh, completing a single search or a single transaction. It becomes more about being a real partner to our clients. And there is something really fun about feeling so included in the story that these companies are building and telling in the market. Mm. That that's fascinating to me. Um, not coming from the world from from your world of recruiting and and search. This idea of what you just said, feeling like a part of this, it just points me to the, the fact that you're not just an outsourcer, a vendor that's getting resources or getting building a team for this this early stage, an early stage company as an example. Tell me more about the the specialness of Sloan that that it is that you're really partnering with your clients in this building phase. Sure. So uh, when you work with early stage and growth stage companies, 
there is a really heavy focus on the importance of the company that you're building. So it becomes much less about we have this position open, we have a vacancy, this is what we need the person to do, and more about we need this person to be part of a team and this is what our team is striving to do. And that feels different when you tell that story that way in the market. And so um, being able to be part of building a company and looking back and say, oh my gosh, we placed five of their executives or we placed 15 people in that company over three years. There is something that uh, then sort of forever ties you to that organization in a way that it wouldn't happen if you were not more deeply involved than just completing a single search. Mm -hmm. And you've been CEO for eight years, if, if I'm not mistaken. What have you, who have you become? Let's, you know, I'm curious about the, the, the firm, but I'm wondering over these eight years, who have you become as a, as a person, as a leader, as you think about that, that that's actually quite a long time uh, and 17 years in total at the, at the firm, but the last eight years, who would you say you've become? So certainly I have become someone who is obsessed with excellence. Hmm. And that is, I think, both a positive and a negative. It's a strength and a weakness for me. Uh, it is something that has become more intense for me over the years because I think about what it is we do and we are in a services business. We are focused on people and everything that we do every day leaves a person with an experience. And when this is your business, the experience of that person is everything. And so anytime an experience is less than exceptional, it's really hard for me to accept. And um, it matters. It really, really matters. Um, as a leader, I really hope uh, that I've become more patient, more understanding. Um, when I think back eight years ago to who I was then, I, admittedly, I, I was not great. And I probably was in over my head yeah. and um, I got an executive coach and he's still a coach and has been amazing. He's taught me. I know I still have a lot to learn, but I try hard every day to be better than I was the day before. And um, it's not easy. You know, the the pressures that leaders are under and the just the the weight that you carry every single day protecting a company and the people in a company, it is not an easy thing to do. And so you have to grow and you have to always look at yourself and say, say where can I improve? Where can I grow? And so I, I do try to remind myself of that every day. Mm. It's an interesting dichotomy or distinction between these two qualities of, of your becoming this this dedication to excellence, um, and you even called it maybe in some ways a, a weakness as well as a strength, and then this this part about patience. Um, take us into what that looks like. This the melding of becoming a person of patience, um, and a person who is just dogged around excellence, because they would see maybe on the surface that they're contradictory in some ways. And they are. Uh, and that's why it's hard because it, it doesn't fit neatly together. Um, I am by nature, not a patient person. And when I say that, I mean, not patient with myself, not patient naturally with others. And, uh, you know, sort of have that mindset that I, I just want everything to be 
done the right way all the time. And, and that's not a reasonable way to look at life because it's, it's just never going to be like that. It's what you have to work at every day to make things absolutely as good as they can be. And so what has happened to me over the last eight years is really coming to terms with that, understanding that, appreciating that, and allowing myself um, the time to feel what I feel Mm -hmm. about whatever didn't go the way that I feel it needed to, and to... um, you know, feel that before I talk about it, feel that before I act on it. Uh, Because if you, if you act first, then that's when that lack of patience, lack of empathy, lack of understanding comes out. And so part of it is just slowing down and doing things in the right order. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, the the phrase which is a buzzword in leadership and behavioral circles is that you've become emotionally intelligent or more emotionally intelligent even as you describe allowing yourself to feel frustrated or dissatisfied but slowing down to be aware okay I'm feeling that now how am i going to respond instead of react to those feelings that's um Again, emotional intelligence is the phrase that an awareness of yourself and what you need, it feels like that has been part of this process for you. It it absolutely has been part of the process, a, a huge part of the process. And um, I think that the awareness that you talk about, again, there you don't always have to react with urgency to every situation. And that is something that is a hard lesson to learn. Sometimes patience wins the day in terms of how you handle a situation and um, how effective you are in addressing it going forward. And again, just being aware of that fact and applying that to whatever situation presents itself is I think hugely important and not always easy to do. Mm. And as a leader of a team, I can imagine the gift of that first for you, but also the possibility of that as a gift uh, to be able to impart to your team. Is that this this awareness, emotional intelligence, slowing down, is this part of how you are developing your team and investing in them to give them the gift that you've been given? So I try for sure. Um, We are a virtual company. And I think one of the limitations of being in a virtual company is that you don't have the same opportunity to observe everything all the time. Because unless you are in a Zoom meeting together and having a conversation that where you happen to be dialed in to the same uh, activity, you're not experiencing that same level of um, just uh, ability to see how others handle things. And so it's not an easy thing to do. I do try to make sure that I'm modeling that behavior uh, when I talk with the leaders here. And I feel so very, very fortunate to have a, a leadership team that has been here for a really long time. And I believe they would tell you that we have grown together. Mm. I think that they would say many of the same things that I'm saying to you in terms of what they have learned and what's hard about being a leader and, you know, how confusing it can be sometimes when things are happening that um, you just couldn't have predicted. You couldn't have sort of trained against it because it wouldn't have occurred to you that something like that would happen. And I think that's one of the hardest things about being a leader is just not always being able to head off things 
that you you would not have expected to happen. Mm. I'm I'm wondering too, Leslie, of your unique stamp. And maybe this is it that you're describing, but over the when you took on this role eight years ago, the culture was of a certain nature, and I'm sure there's still many of the similar elements. I'm wondering what's the unique stamp on the culture that you sense or you, that you explicitly have brought you and your longstanding leadership team. What would you say that unique stamp on the culture has been? So I don't feel like I can take uh, credit for the initial stages of how Sloan Partners was built. Adam Sloan is the founder of Sloan Partners and um, he loves, loves the company and um, is very proud of the company and really cares about the type of company that we are building. And so credit goes to Adam for the beginnings of Sloan Partners and for supporting uh, the company uh, still today. And so I, I want to start with that. I think that what has evolved over time is just um, sort of sort of what happens naturally when a company grows. So I was employee number five when I joined, and now we have about 70 employees. And there's a big difference between having five employees and having 70 employees. And how do you continue to protect the culture when you have that many people and everyone is in a different place. And so I think the thing that we did um, it, during the time that I've been CEO that is really important to the company is uh, per the recommendation of another industry leader, um, we created culture clubs within the company that are owned by the employees. So everything that comes out of the culture clubs that impacts the culture in our company is driven by our employees. And it really is an amazing thing to see how people embrace something that they feel ownership in. And so I do feel like that has been one of the key things that have, has happened in the relatively recent past that has had a, a very positive impact on who we are. Um, and, you know, as an example, one of our um, one of our culture clubs uh, began the process of um, implementing a quarterly newsletter that is completely internal to Sloan Partners and is full of recognition of our employees, things that are going on in the industry. Uh, we have a section that is uh, called Dear Adam, uh, where they get to ask our founder a question and he responds. And it's just a bright spot in all the work that we do that is so hard every day. And everyone in our company looks forward to seeing that newsletter. It's so fun to see the recognition for people in all departments at all levels. Mm -hmm. it, it, it strikes me that because here at Brilliance Within, we do a lot of culture work and we, we do preach culture starts at the top. Um, and what I'm observing and I'm super curious about to learn more separately is this the bottom up as well. It's this what I sense is it's the merger of a strong leadership, setting a tone, setting the culture that even preceded you with your founder and now infusing the bottom up through these culture clubs feels like a really um, powerful mix of the two. I think that's absolutely correct. And I don't believe that we would be the company that we are today without that commitment from everyone in the organization. I I don't see how that would be possible because while a leadership team can model the right behavior, they can't enforce it in every department, every day, every level, every action. And when there is that ownership throughout, then there's a different level of, of commitment to what we want to be as a company. Mm. Hmm. And 
you're walking this journey of building a culture, creating a special place to work right alongside clients who are doing the exact same thing in their own way, in their own context. Um, but it feels like you're walking this walk and living it in your own way right alongside uh, your your clients. And I'm wondering, has that ever been or is that ever a um, a point of influence that you're able to have on these early stage companies? Yes. Um, so uh, it's fairly common that in the early days of a partnership that we are talking with our clients about culture because they are in that place of building a company in many cases and wanting to build it right. Uh, and so we do have conversations about what that means to them, what they're doing in order to accomplish that. Um, I just actually uh, last week met with a client and uh this is a, a client that has a special place in my heart. And they asked me to join a retreat uh, and talk to them about the company that we have built at Sloan Partners because their experience with us has been really positive. And they can tell that our clients mean a lot to us and that we care deeply about their experience and that our team is very committed. And they wanted to understand more about how we have gotten to that place Mm. where there's so much commitment from everyone. And so I uh, I had an hour uh, with them to talk about the things that we do here. And um, now they're talking about, you know, what are some of the things that we are doing that they might be able to implement that would be meaningful for their organization. So that's just a real-time example that happened last week. I love that. I mean, it really speaks to this idea of partner and and that you're not just a vendor who gets a phone call or an email with a request of a space to fill. Uh, it really speaks to that. Uh, Leslie, I want to transition into the name of the show, uh, Conversations Life Science, and to, for you as well, healthcare. Conversations Life Science Leaders Aren't Having. When you hear me just name that, the name of our show. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? So my perspective on this is really that it's it's less about specific to life sciences and more about just conversations that leaders aren't having, or at least conversations that leaders are not having enough of. Uh, so I would position it it that way because I think that there are some pretty universal truths about uh, things that happen in leadership that transcend the boundaries of industry verticals. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the first thing um, I would mention, and this goes back to what we were just talking about as it relates to culture and behaviors and um, what that means in an organization. So um, when we launch a search, uh, we have an intake meeting and let's say that it's a brand new client. And uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about in that intake meeting is the culture of the company. And it is very common for the leaders to say to our team, we know everybody talks about their values and their culture, but here we really live it. Like I, I hear that statement very, very frequently. And uh, the thing that happens sometimes is that we move through the search process and as candidates experience the company and the culture through the interviews it doesn't always add up to align with exactly what the client shared with us on the outset. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I would like for conversations to come back to is, you know, I, I think it's always important to ask for feedback, A. Um, so asking for real feedback about candidate experiences and what what we are observing and and others too any any partners that they work with um to make sure that the statement that 
we really live these values. We really live this culture to make sure that other people are experiencing that. And it's not, um, you know, a little bit of uh, naivete as it relates to this is happening throughout our organization. And maybe it's not. So, um, and it's it's so hard because the pressures on these businesses are really high. Mm. The pressure is high. And, um, you know, there are time time frames that have to be met and there is intensity around the work. It's serious work. And so I think it's very hard to balance everything, but asking for feedback is one way to make sure that um, you are in tune with what's actually happening. Mm. Do you think it's a matter of the of this time or is it the emperor has no clothes where there's a, an environment where they say we're living our values, but there's folks in the room or vendor partners, you guys are, are not saying what needs to be said. What, what do you think's going on there? So I don't think it's the emperor has no clothes. I think it is, um, more that there is a perhaps a genuine belief that all is well and perhaps not taking the extra steps to ensure that all is well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's more of that. Again, just going back to the intensity of the work and and how much pressure is on these businesses to perform every day, to hit certain milestones. Um, it, it's, it's a lot. And so I, I think that uh, there needs to be some checks and balances in place to just make sure that, uh, you know, the company that you think you are building is actually the company that you are building. Mm. Ooh, that's a really powerful phrase. Is the company that you think you're building actually the company that you're building. I mean, that is a, oof, I have to really sit with that, that, that question. That's a, that's even a powerful coaching question in my world. Um, what are, I mean, there's a, a, probably a bazillion questions around feedback that someone can get to get at that statement or, or at that. But I'm wondering what are some of your key questions that you see are important to ask to get to the heart of that is the company you think you're building the one that you're actually building. So what you just said is actually at the core of what you have to do. And that is ask questions. So if you're not asking questions, you don't know. Got it. And I think that it, there are a lot of of leaders, and I and frankly, I think this was a gap for me uh, in in the earlier days of leadership is not asking questions, just kind of going along and thinking things were okay, and they may not have been okay. Um, so I think it starts with just having the courage to ask questions, to not be afraid of asking the questions, to not be afraid of getting the answers and thinking about, you know, there are going to be positive responses and negative responses and thinking of both of those things as a gift mm. because the positive, you can continue to, um, you know, strengthen that the negatives you can work on. Uh, one of the things that we do here is that I, I mentioned that I have an executive coach and this executive coach is also an executive coach for the other leaders in our company. And so there it's, it's almost this continuous 360 feedback that I get and um, I invite it. I ask him is there anything that I need to know? Is there anything new that I need to work on? Is there anything that I am ignoring that I need to not be ignoring? I'm constantly asking every month during our coaching meeting, I ask those questions mm -hmm. and I want him to tell me. And I think that um, one of the things that perhaps 
leaders overlook is the power of getting that feedback and being able to use it for good. Mm. And I just get the sense it creates a lot of safety and courage for a person to investigate in that way that you are and that you invite your clients to, to as well, a, a tremendous amount of courage and vulnerability to, to be able to say, if I don't have clothes on, tell me I don't have clothes on back to that. So the fable of the emperor has no clothes. Um, is it, is that what it feels like vulnerability and courage that that you've also been able and your team has been able to cultivate to have that kind of environment? So certainly I, I do think that there is some vulnerability there um, for sure. And, and, you know, it's interesting because it used to be really hard for me to hear the criticism. Um, and, I didn't look forward to the coaching calls the way I do now. It actually brings me a sense of peace to feel like I'm in the know of the things that I need to work on. And so it it really has been a, a mind shift hmm. for me. Um, and now my monthly coaching calls are one of the favorite, my favorite things that I get to do every month. And it's not that there's never any um, constructive feedback. There is, but it's it's also it's rewarding to have conversations about how you have grown, and it is important to have conversations about areas where you can continue to grow. And instead of it feeling like something that I don't want to engage in. Now it is something that I can't wait for. Mm. It it feels like you have embraced this idea of becoming. I didn't frame this quote, this quote before, but the, the quote by John Ruskin, the highest, the highest reward for your work is not what you get from it, but who you become from it. What I hear you and your team saying is, yes, we want to serve. We hope and plan for Sloan to be successful, but this is this is an endeavor of of us growing and becoming as well. I I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it, if you just asked me uh, outright, who have you become? I my answer would be I have become this person that is obsessed with excellence. However, I have also become a person that while obsessed with excellence i can i can slow down a little bit examine situations be a little more patient um and and think about something that perhaps didn't go as well as it really needed to go and use that as an opportunity to create a different process or solution that will protect us in the future mm, yeah it's really good and there's another subject that I, I imagine is very relevant and real day to day that requires some courage to dig into with your clients, and that's diversity. It's a it's a buzzy word um, in in employment and in the workforce. I'm wondering what are the courageous conversations around diversity that you're inviting your clients to have. It's a, it's a huge topic and it's a, a little bit of a scary topic because you can approach this conversation with the best of intentions in terms of what you want to come out of it. And you just, it's, it's can be a polarizing topic and you never know exactly how someone's going to feel um, as a result of the conversation. And so I'm going to start with just a little bit of a, a personal story that sort of explains why one of the reasons that I am I'm so passionate about it. And so um, I uh, have a daughter in high school. Um, we adopted her from Guatemala. So she is Hispanic. Um, we brought her home when she was four months old. And now she is, uh, you know, 
getting ready to finish up her uh, junior year of high school. So um, she, we are we are all she knows. Um, my daughter uh, started elementary school at one school, and she was for sure the only non-white child in her grade, possibly the only non-white child in her school. Um, if there were others, I never saw them. Um, and there was a particular day when my daughter came home from school and said, basically, I wish I just looked like you. And that is a very, very hard thing for a parent to hear. And um, that led me to write to the principal of another school where there is much more diversity in the population of the um, students and explain the situation, what my daughter had said, why I was writing and asking for a permit so that I could take my daughter to this other school. Hmm. And that's what we did. And um, it it was, in fact, a much more diverse school. And she was very happy there. And um, it was the right decision. So um, I look at my child and I think she's amazing and she is smart and she is kind and she should look at the world and think that she can and believe that she can do anything she wants to do, anything. And I want all kids to feel that way. And I want all people to feel that way. Uh, so that is part of what pushes me uh, in this particular area. Now, uh, we are very fortunate at Sloan Partners because we have a, um, a practice leader uh, for cultural solutions. Her name is Candace Norte, and she is a fabulous human being, a fabulous mother, um, a fabulous contributor to society just in general. And one of the reasons that I love her so much is because she makes every conversation a safe conversation. And she and I have had many conversations about this particular topic. Uh, Candace is a Black woman um, and very successful as an educator before uh, transitioning into our company, where she's still educating just to a different audience. And one of the things that uh, she and I very much agree on is the fact that this problem that we face with the, um, the lack of diversity, particularly in leadership in uh, life sciences uh, companies, is that it is cyclical, meaning that um, there are barriers to access, um, starting with education, that prevent individuals from pursuing careers that would allow them to advance in life sciences. And then you look at the companies, much like my daughter looked at the school she was in and did not see herself. She didn't see herself there. And uh, people don't see themselves, people of color and um, other uh, aspects that are, you know, considered to be marginalized groups. They don't see themselves in leadership in life sciences companies. And I think that all of this contributes to an ongoing pattern that is not advancing the issue in a way that we would all like to see it move. So uh, I think that solving the problem is not in any way, shape, or form simple. I certainly am not suggesting that. I do think that, um, that the problem is starting much earlier in the life cycle of a young person than what we are doing anything to help. And certainly things are getting better as it relates to STEM programs and supporting uh, young people so that they know what these opportunities are. 
but it's just a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a slog um, in terms of, you know, the pace and would love to see it be different. Mm. What I can imagine you've had a similar conversation or expressed some similar things to, to clients or prospective clients and they are nodding their head in agreement. Um, and maybe in some, some ways like the, the client just last week who invited you to, to speak about what Sloan Partners has done around culture. I'm wondering what are some of the steps that you are supporting your clients to take to move the needle within their organization around diversity? So Candace is a consultant and she actually has many, many programs that she has curated herself around microaggressions and anti-bias training and diversity recruiting and um, uh, just developing a, a complete strategy around how you build your company with diversity in mind and leadership coaching. She does all of those things. And she is absolutely brilliant at it. And so I, I think that, you know, if, if companies value this and want this to be part of their story and part of how they build their company, the answer is not showing up to a, a launch meeting with a search firm and saying, we need to hire a person of color for this role. That is that is putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem. Hmm. They need to get the support early and build their company with a complete strategy in mind because putting a Band-Aid on it is just that. It, it doesn't actually solve the problem and, and it's, it's not a long-term solution. And so I think getting the um, external support, having the resources to make sure that you are building a company with this in mind is critically important to the success of making it happen. Mm. It it feels like just, you didn't see the word strategy, but just as much as they would have a go-to-market strategy, a commercialization strategy, that what I hear you inviting companies to do is from as, as early as possible to have a strategy yes. around diversity and not 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 band-aid patches along the way. Yes. So 100% that is absolutely correct and this is one of those things like anything that is important in business if you don't do it with a strategy, if you don't do it with a plan, if you don't do it with intent, it doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah, and you could apply those exact words to what we talked about before with culture um and being the type of company that they think they're building, that they are actually that that company. Um, really, really insightful, Leslie. We're, we're coming to the end, unfortunately, of our conversation, but I want to give you the magic wand question that we ask all of our guests, and that's you get, with a wave of a wand, you get to plant the seed in the minds of life science and healthcare CEOs all over the globe, one conversation that they're going to have over the next week. What's that one conversation that you want to seed with this wave of your wand? So I, I feel like I'm answering this question and saying, staying in the same space of where we have been, because I do think it is that important. As a search firm executive, um, you might imagine that working in the life sciences, I am every day talking to amazingly brilliant, intelligent, exciting uh, people and companies that are doing things that in many ways almost seem like science fiction. It's so interesting, you know, the direction that science and technology has gone. Uh, and I probably on average talk to about five companies a week where, um, you know, I'm just amazed by what they're doing um, and the science, the technology the funding that they have to make it all happen. Um, it, it's really incredible. And so my point in sharing that with you is that there is no shortage of exciting science, exciting technology, and 
and funding to support the the innovation that's happening. Um, what I think is most important is that people focus on what is the company that we want to build and who are we going to build that team with and how are we together going to achieve these goals that are transformative for the industry, for patients, um, you know, that are life-saving and uh, really thinking about how do we want to build our company and coming back to the people and focusing on that. Um, and as a search firm, I, I really wish that, um, that the executives in these companies would have those conversations, not just this week or next week, but all the time, Mm. because I think that is how you get the sort of commitment and passion in your organization that every CEO wants to have, that every company and board wants to see. Um, so that's, that's the conversation, um, uh, I would love for everyone to be having. Mm. I love it. And I'll just, I'll bring forward for our audience, the question we had before. So you just put, I think the question was, who do we want to be? Who do we want to become? And how do we create that team to be that? And then the check-in question is, are we becoming the company that we think we're becoming? Yeah. So that I think the marriage of those two uh, could be really, really powerful. Great. <laughs> Leslie, this has been really an amazing conversation. Um, if folks want to know more about you or about Sloan Partners, where can we send them? So our uh, website is www.sloanpartners.com. And I have to tell everyone there is no A in Sloan. It is S-L-O-N-E partners.com. I say that because we have tried over the years to convince our founder to change the spelling of his last name because everyone wants to put an A in Sloan. Uh, So there's that. And then I am Leslie at sloanpartners.com. I welcome the outreach and I have so enjoyed talking to you, Jeff. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, it's our pleasure and excited for all the insights that that, uh, our audience will get. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you.